at one of the more difficult aspects of this journey of awakening we're on. You might say begin by taking it way off the charts. Let's take this moment all the way out to the radical notion that uh, there's a subtle grace involved in getting so completely screwed by someone that your jaw is locked down and you fantasize doing what you might call a dirty, hairy number on the perp. Has anybody ever been there? Overwhelming sense of animosity. How's that feel? Is that, is that an adorable feeling or what? Huh? Oh, wow. I'll bet we all have been there, perhaps as recently as this morning. But what's this business of finding grace that I keep running into and all the, all the writings I read relative to exposing the consciousness of the people who have taken a way out? <clears throat> what's this business of finding grace right in the middle of a painful chain yanking? <clears throat> Consider what the Sufi master Piv Eliot Khan counsels us to overcome any bitterness that may have come because, now don't miss this, overcome any business that may have come because you were not up to the magnitude of the pain entrusted to you. Do you catch that? In our movement through life, we're constantly encountering an infinite variety of opportunities an infinite variety of situations and circumstances. And I had never ever before I read this, i have never ever thought of them as finding grace right in the middle of a painful chain yanking. Or you may have come, that may have come into my life because the universe felt I was up to the magnitude of the pain entrusted to me. Like the mother of the world, who carries the pain of the world in her heart, you are sharing in a certain measure of that cosmic pain and are called upon to meet it in joy instead of self-pity. Just what you wanted to hear, right? <laughs> oh, goody gumdrop. Be the mother of the world. Meet the cosmic pain in joy instead of self-pity. Sure, I'll do that tomorrow. But I say check it out in this moment. What comes up for you as you consider being called on to share in a certain measure of that cosmic pain and to do it with a smile on your face? Is it, oh sure, anytime. Just bring it on, I'm here, I'm up to it. Or is it otherwise? That's a question. And the Jesus ethic certainly doesn't cut us any slack on this issue at all. Remember his counsel? that echoes that same sentiment. It was such a wonderful moment in scripture. It was in Matthew 8, chapter 21st verse, where Peter is recorded to have come to Jesus and said, Master, how many times do I have to forgive this fellow? Seven times? Now can't you just hear Peter bargaining? And you know where he's coming from. Obviously he has an encounter with somebody who's he perceives as busting his chops in a great fashion and he's about up to here with it but he's still kind of got that little residue of Jesus reminder forgive forgive and you shall be forgiven I better check this out with master how many times did you say we got to forgive seven times because he's already up on it and remember Jesus's response I can just see him now hey <laughs> they Jesus, how many times, Peter? No, not seven times, my brother. Seventy times, seven times. Which is biblical math for as long as it takes, my brother. As long as it takes. You keep working that out. So Jesus didn't cut us any slack in the side either. And there we have it again. In the face of our tribulations, be ye of good cheer. And do it even when the world lays a trip on us. It routinely leaves us lost in the reactivity of bitterness and outrage. Now, how's that for a challenge? I don't know about you, but it certainly gets me in a deep place. But apparently, apparently that's our work, or one of the aspects of our work in the spiritual domain. 
at least part of that work this time through. The spiritual work of learning to replace frustration and resentment with compassion and understanding on those occasions we encounter an event that's bringing us an opportunity to share in a certain measure of the cosmic pain and do it with gratitude. Gratitude that we've been invited to share in that grace of bringing solace and awakening to another human being. It's a Persian poet out there. We talk about him a lot. His name is Rumi. He was totally conversant with the notion that all human experience all human experience would wisely be embraced with an attitude of gratitude. Consider the wisdom in this poem, Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house, he may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whomever comes because each has been sent as a guide from the beyond. I don't know if you're ready to get your mind and heart wrapped around that, but let me suggest you give it a shot because it's a whole new way of taking a look at these times when the, they come at you pretty hard and heavy. Wow, I got this is part of my dance? I don't think so, but it is. But why gratitude for encountering these moments? Where's the grace in being invited to embrace a certain measure of the cosmic pain or a crowd of sorrows? What's to be grateful for? Well, try this. Could it be in knowing that because you have mastered the spiritual art of forgiveness, a brother or sister's heart is beating a lot easier out? somewhere in the circle of life that includes you. Try living in that reality base for a while, and I'm confident you'll agree that it just doesn't get any better than that. Can you hear that? There goes another human being whose heart is breathing a lot easier because I've been doing a little work in the spiritual dimension. And it's empowered me to respond to foolishness with compassion and understanding. Yeah, leaving that being in a much different place but, but it's the joy of knowing that another human being has been blessed by the touch of your spiritually awakened heart, the only grace available in an encounter of the cosmic pain kind. Try this. When it comes to considering forgiveness, it is wise not to begin with the spiritually uninformed notion that you are doing a favor for someone who you believe hurt you. I say believe hurt you because it's never true. Nobody ever hurt you. Nobody ever made you mad or bad or sad or glad, for that matter. You do that to yourself, for yourself, over stuff people do. They don't hurt you. They show up and be dumb. You choose to respond to it in a way that hurts. So that empowers us. I wouldn't have it any other way. If it was any other way, then my, my happiness, my content, my serenity depends on your capacity to live your life according to my script. And that's what we're bellyaching about. How dare you? Didn't you read the instructions I left for you? You're never supposed to speak to me in that tone of voice or say those unkind words. You make me so angry. You upset me so much. And that's been the big lie. We've been living under the thrall of forever and ever and ever. They don't make us mad. We make ourselves mad over the dumb stuff they do by insisting that they not do it. Is that the ultimate ridiculous insanity? I insist you live your life a constant presentation of infinitely awakened humanity. That's what I want you to be with me all the time. Does that sound a little dumb when you say it that way? Yeah, right. That's the dance. Well, when it comes to considering forgiveness, that's why it's wise not to begin with the spiritually uninformed notion that you are doing a favor for someone who hurt you. Nobody hurt you. You're remembering that, but with the idea that you're being merciful to yourself to create the energy of frustration and resentment over anyone or anything is to poison your own heart. And each time you replay the perceived injury in your mind, 
you pump a little more venom into your sense of peace and contentment. Boy, how many of you are sitting on that stool next to that great big old Guernsey cow with your hands on its tips, pulling as hard as you can, milking your melodrama to the very end? That's the image I use for myself, and I catch myself doing that. There you go again. Get up from the stool, you jerk. You'll never be able to empty that udder. Yeah. No matter how hard and how long you nurse it, it's always going to be there until you just get up and walk away. Let him be. Let him be. So if you're trying to decide whether someone deserves your forgiveness, you're certainly asking the wrong question. Ask instead whether you deserve to be someone who consistently tastes the sweet nectar of understanding and compassion, hanging ourselves out to dry on a line of bitterness and frustration and resentment is not a fun place to be. It's painful and it's full of grace. Now how can that be, you might inquire? Consider this. What is the great desire that accompanies all suffering? Exactly, exactly. To be done with it. To be finished, put it behind us. And the quest for that resolution can lead to seemingly miraculous, miraculous human encounters. Consider this powerful story from Jack Kornfield's book, The Art of Forgiveness. It emerged out of a mother's crying need to quit hurting and experience the grace of becoming a mother of the world, capable of handling the magnitude of pain entrusted to her. No matter how extreme circumstances, a transformation of the heart is possible. Once on a train from Washington to Philadelphia, I found myself seated next to an African-American man who had worked for the State Department in India, but had quit to run the rehabilitation program for juvenile offenders in the District of Columbia. Most of the youth he worked with were gang members who had committed homicide. One 14-year-old boy in his program had shot and killed an innocent, completely innocent teenager to prove himself to his gang. At the trial, the victim's mother sat impassively, silent, until the end, when the youth was convicted of the killing. After the verdict was announced, she stood up slowly, stared directly at him and stated, I'm going to kill you. Then the youth was taken away to serve several years in a juvenile facility. After the first half year, the mother of the slain child went to visit her killer, his killer. He had been living on the streets before the killing, and she was the only visitor he'd had. For a time they talked, and when she left, she gave him some money for cigarettes. Then she started, step by step, to visit him more regularly, bringing food, small gifts. Near the end of his sentence, she asked him what he would be doing when he got out. He was confused and, and very concerned, so she offered to set him up with a job at a friend's company. Then she inquired about where he would live. And since he had no family to return to, she offered him temporary use of the spare room in her home. For eight months, he lived there, ate her food, worked the job. Then one evening, she called him into the living room to talk. She sat down opposite him and waited. Then she started. Do you remember in the courtroom when I said I was going to kill you? I sure do, he replied. Well, I did, she went on. I did. I do not want the boy who could kill my son so indifferently to remain alive on this earth. I wanted him to die. That's why I started to visit you and bring you things. That's why I got you the job and let you live here in my house. That's how I went about changing you. And now the boy that was lost, that ignorant kid, he's gone. So now I want to ask you, since my son is gone and that killer is gone, if you'll stay here. I've got the room. I'd like to adopt you if you let me. Thus she became the mother of her son's killer, the mother he never had. And in that moment, 
she also became the mother of the world, choosing to embrace her cosmic pain with compassion, lack of rage. Got it? Got it? I don't imagine many of us have stories that dramatic, but there's not a one of us that hasn't lived through tribulations of one sort or another. Those challenges, those moments that Harry Hart Brown calls AFGOs, it's an acronym, AFGO, another friggin' growth opportunity. <laughs> AFGOs that invite us right where we are in large and small ways in our own families and communities to patiently master the spiritual art of replacing the separation and bitterness with connection and compassion over and over again. As many times as it takes, 70 times, seven times, to demonstrate that we are up to the magnitude of the pain entrusted to us. So let's not trivialize the effect of each wise action, no matter how insignificant it may seem. Remember, just as the recurrent fall of raindrops fills the water bucket, so over time, dedicated seekers become rich in compassion through small increments in their commitment to diligently seek the grace of a love that wraps all existence in the soft fabric of the Cosmic Mother's eternal forgiveness. Enjoy the grace, beautiful ones. Enjoy the grace. So take my